Welcome, everyone, to our third Stories First online web seminars. Um, thank you for joining us. I know we had a, a, some technical issues last time, and we're trying out Zoom this time just to see if it's um, an easier platform for us to share um, our, our, our presentations, our videos, and then we will be recording this Zoom session to put onto our YouTube channel for everyone else to be able to watch. Um, tonight, um, we will have Katrin, um, who is going to talk about her experience this year of having to switch from classroom story listening teaching onto an online um, story listening platform and the effects um, of, of her program on her students' vocabulary acquisition rate. And we will also be joined by Ken Smith, who works here in Taiwan. And he is going to be talking about a replication case study he did um, in Indonesia with Dr. Crash and Dr. Mason, also regarding um, vocabulary ac acquisition rate with story listening versus story listening plus. And we're gonna co conclude this evening with um, a talk by Dr. Krashen about direct teaching of vocabulary. So please be sure to um, subscribe to our YouTube channel for um, notifications. And this evening, um, the participants that are in, in the waiting room or, or that have joined now, um, feel free to chat in the chat box and we'll be make sure to answer questions as they come up. So I'm gonna uh, hand it over to Katrin, who is going to talk about her experience this year. Okay, I hope everyone can hear me now because I can't hear me. <laughs> Thank you, Micah. Um, okay, hi, hello everyone. Um, as Ben said, my name is Katrin Schechtman. I'm a German as a foreign language teacher in Germany at an international school. Um, and last year I taught fourth grade um, and I've been teaching everything from first through eighth grade. Um, so the one thing I want to talk about, uh, talk about first is switching from story listening in the class, which is just fantastic and a pleasure, um, to story listening online. So that transfer to remote learning that we all had to do and probably most of us weren't all too happy about. Um, so I switched to uh, remote learning on March 6th. So this was a, um, a week prior to everyone else in Germany switching to remote learning because we had a case of COVID already at our school. So it was uh, closed earlier. At that point, we had done about 67 stories in class. So I did a story every single class, sometimes two or three, especially in the beginning when they were shorter. Um, and so when we switched on to remote learning, I had told stories that were about 30 to 40 minutes long. Um, and my class would sit through the 40 minute story and they would listen attentively. So we had built all that, um, the listening capabilities of them and the listening skills. Um, and so when I went to, to teach online, the first videos that I recorded, because we're not using Zoom with our classes, um, so I had to pre-record the video and then upload it. Um, and the first one I made was just as long. <laughs> so it was over 40 minutes long. And I was like, yeah, they can do this because that's what we do in class. Um, and I very quickly found out that that was way too long, that this is just a whole different medium to watch something on the screen or to watch someone in front of me and with all that energy in the classroom um, that you just don't have when you're speaking to a camera. So I realized that that was not, that was my best idea when I did that. Um, and I adjusted it and I actually turned it down so much that we were below 20 minutes for the stories that I sent them home. Um, 
because really at home, there's so many distractions. You're not in class, you're not with your classmates. You know, a younger sibling might be playing something, somebody might poke you in the eye, or um, your parents are doing something, mom needs to use the computer, you really only have a couple minutes. Honestly, most parents, as I wouldn't as a parent, like don't want to want to have their, their kids in front of the screen for all day, um, since it's not the only class, obviously, that they're taking. Um, so there's a lot of drawbacks with doing this online. And um, so the amount of input is decreased a lot. Um, so the other thing then, on top of it being decreased in time is that when I record the video, I don't have the most important thing, which is my students, which is their feedback, which is their looking at them and saying, okay, they're, they're getting this. Um, having them respond to me, not by me asking them questions, but that's what kids do. They respond to what's going on in facial expressions and gestures and also um, they responded a lot in German at that point. And so I had none of that. Um, so the comprehension check that I had built in with my class was also gone once I recorded the video. So I had to wait until I uploaded the video and then had to do a little comprehension check on afterwards to see, hey, did they understand the story? Now, I already told them 67 stories prior to going online, which means I had a pretty good feeling for what they could understand I knew all the stories that they heard before and their reactions to certain things. Um, but what I really had to do was I had to add a ton of comprehension aiding supplementation. So things that I might not have done anymore in the classroom, things that I might not have drawn in anymore in the classroom, I had to add this back in because I wanted to make sure it is really comprehensible. Um, just because there is no way to adjust it during the lesson. It's just, it is what it is. It's a video. It's done. It's not synchronized with my class. It's not in the same room. So um, that's the other drawback that you have. Now, of course, it's possible that your school does it differently and you meet through Zoom. So then you are in the same virtual room, at least like we are now, right? Um, but that's tricky because as we saw last week when Ben did his uh, demo for beginners, the board was really small. So he was close to it and, and you could see sort of like part of the board. So my board is behind me and I have a pretty big blackboard in my living room. Um, but for you, in order to see this, I would have to push this table that you're on right now. I would have to push it back and I would have to step back. So the further I go back, the smaller you become. And even if I have it on grid view and I see lots of you, um, you become really small. It's really tricky because then what do, you, what do you do? Do you unmute everyone? Which with fourth grade might not be such a good idea. Um, but also with upper grades might not be such a good idea. You, you don't know. You have to see like the comprehension checking then is really tricky with a big class. Now I've also done story lessoning online via Zoom with um, another adult and we've got done lessons back and forth and it was a one-on-one -on -one setting. That's very different because at that point I have the person this big on the screen and I can see and there's no one else talking in. Um, so that's much easier to do. But even then, I find that um, the length of story that you can take still has to be decreased, even though we are talking one on one and this is live um, because it's just, we're so used to being on the computer and doing a hundred things at once. Nobody really sits at the computer and just is like totally focused on what they're doing. Then something else is running and, you know, so it is a harder thing. It's harder on your eyes um, to do it on the screen. So the time really has to be decreased. Um, now, obviously there's also an upside because if something is not understood, they could go back. So they could rewind, which they can't in class, um, but then they can ask me to repeat it. So 
Mm -hmm. um, they could also pause it if the video is too long, but then that's really losing the flow of the story and you have to go back and you have to remember what happened yesterday. Um, and that's also not uh, optimal. Um, one thing I feel I, I see with watching some videos that are online with story listening and where the students are missing, and it is a recording, um, you have to really be careful to not get carried away, to not forget that the goal here is comprehension and to not get into a mode where you're just performing and you're telling the story and you're so into the story and you don't have anyone go, huh? That you forget this needs to also be comprehensible. I just set this whole chunk, this whole big, like, you know, 10 minute speech, or even if it's just, um, three sentences and I haven't, I haven't explained anything. I haven't used any supplementation. That's a problem. Um, and it's much easier to fall into that trap when you're not with your students than when you're with them, because somebody will say something if you bought, if you, if you created that climate in the classroom where they feel open to, to do so. Um, yeah. So some hints though, or some helpful tips, if you are in that situation where you have to do this, because like I said, we, none of us chose to do this, but this is the reality right now, um, are you definitely need a microphone for good sound because um, you turn away from the, from the camera and all of a sudden my whole body is to the camera. Um, it's sometimes hard to, to tell you know, what am I in front of when I'm writing on the board? Um, and as soon as I turn away, then it's like the sound is muffled. Um, attention span, like I said, make them shorter, shorter is much, much better. Um, and just keep in mind that it is not the same thing. It is not a replacement. It is not a 100% replacement for what you do in class. It's just cannot be. Um, yeah, but we, we all do the best we can. Um, but that is uh, everything I have to say about story listening online. Um, before I went online, though, obviously, I had this very lovely class, and I still have this very lovely class. Um, and the, so the next thing I want to talk to you about is um, how to create or how, about output in an input only classroom. So my students, and I'm going to share my screen with you so you can uh, follow this on my lovely presentation. Okay. So my students, my setting for my class is I'm, like I said, at an international school in Germany. Um, the school language itself is English and I teach German as a foreign language. It is not a second language. Most of our students do not integrate with the broad population in Germany. They have their communities that they uh, stay in, so it, be it an English speaking community, or if they're Japanese students at the Japanese community, most of them are not really uh, bombarded with German input outside of school. Um, you, you hope it would be that way, but it really isn't. Um, so really it's German as a foreign language. They're grade four last year or this year, they were grade four. And I had a very small group. Usually our beginner groups are much bigger. Um, so I had 13 students, or I have 13 students. School year is not over here. Um, and they represented seven, or they represent, I keep talking in the past, it's not over, um, seven countries. So India, USA, France, Brazil, Canada, Japan, and Bulgaria. So you see right away lots of different L1s in my classroom. And because of that, I also have um, a lot of 
EAL students. So not only do they need to learn German, they also need to learn English at the same time when they come to our school. Um, and English, they have in all their subjects, German, they have three hours a week um, with me. So now it doesn't want me to go forward. Yeah, okay. So while they're, we're all beginner in the beginning of the year, that does not equal the same starting point because um, somewhere in the beginner class and they had already taken German before and they just didn't make it out of the beginner class. Um, and then some come in from Japan and they've never had a word of English. They've never have, uh, had a word of German. So that makes it much harder for them than for say someone who's from the Netherlands and the languages are so close that um, half of what I say they would understand without me saying, even explaining it. Um, then there's all to the cultural differences. So some cultures are very uh, taught to be very extroverted, others are more introverted. Um, and so this also shows is in the classroom who likes to speak and who doesn't like to speak even in their L1 because some people just don't want to speak in their L1 and that's totally fine too, right? So we need to respect that in a foreign language class where it's that much harder to find the courage and uh, to say, to speak that language. So, in my class, output is not forbidden. So when I say it's an all input class, I'm not standing there and smacking people on the hand when they're talking. Of course, I want them to try and speak German if they want to. I'm, I'm happy if they, if they trust me to, to take that step. Um, but, and this connects very nicely with last week with Dr. Kreshen's uh, speech, it is not forced, it emerges naturally and that's the room is given for it to emerge naturally. And so if you watch some of the videos from my class, you will hear in the, in the beginning, lots of English and it's switched to more German um, speaking in the classroom and they would make predictions about what happens in the story or parts of the story that just repeat a lot, they would um, speak with me or something, but none of this was asked of them they chose to do this. So the first thing I want to show you is um, my very sweet student here. Uh, she's from India. She's nine years old. She was a total beginner when she came in. Absolutely no German before she set foot into my classroom. Um, and she started sending me these videos of her retelling stories. Um, she was very enthusiastic, or she is very <laughs> enthusiastic about the class. And so she's recorded, I really, I would have to check, but it's been at least 10 of the stories. And I think she wrote at least that many and made comics and just wrote the stories, just sits at home and, and does this. Um, so this recording right here, um, was taken after 28 stories in class. And it's one of the sto stories that we did in class called Geräusch in der Nacht. And I just want to play you a little bit of it um, so you can hear her speak. Da die Geschichte ist, der Name der Geschichte ist Der Grunge in der Nacht. Atava schliefe in der Bett. Plötzlich Atava hören einen Grunsch und Atava saß in der Bett und Atava sagt, sagt, was war das? Und Atava ging in der Kusche, in der Kusche und in der Kusche und Atava saß dir durch, Atava saß dir Stuhl und Atava saß dir Kühlschrank. Auf dem Kühlschrank ist Atavas Vater. Schliefen. Atava sagte, was? Ähm, äh, Vater, geh ins Bett. Geh schliefe. Und Vater sagte, okay. Und Vater ging in der Bett. Okay, I'm gonna stop it right there. 
Um, so if you don't... Uh, die well, Geschichte. That's very nice, but now we're going to stop. <laughs> um, so for those of you who don't speak German, um, she, you can hear, obviously, you can hear she has an act, uh, accent, and I want to point this out now because I'm going to show you another video. So there is a difference there. Um, but what I really like about this is um, I looked at like how many words she spoke. So there were uh, 367 tokens, the total words spoken. And um, I looked at the words per minute. So she spoke about 91.75 words per minute. So the speaking, um, the speech, uh, I'm sorry, the speed of speaking here is actually pretty high. Um, it's very fluent. It's not like she's thinking about it. It's not like reciting a poem that you had to do for class and you're just kind of bringing it out monotonously where every word sounds the same and there's no intonation. Um, it's a very nice flow of the story. It's funny because you hear yourself. Like they pick up a lot of however you, um, <laughs> you do your intonation and how you your flow of the story goes. Um, you see that in your students, it, they pick it up. Um, so she did, she had 367 tokens and 47 types. So the story itself leads to that because it's very repetitive. It, the situation happens over and over again. Um, but what we could hear here were she used um, the regular and irregular past tenses like za, va, those are irregular. Uh, sagte then is regular. Um, she also did use the dative here because she's actually, she says auf dem Kühlschrank. So those are some things that she picked up just from input because none of this was ever explained to her. So this was the first video. Now, this is the same girl. Um, but this is now a story that she did after 83 stories in class. So I have to see, so after 15 remote stories, so 67 in class, 15 remote, um, she chose to keep doing this, record the videos, mom is sending them to me. Um, so I just want you to hear the difference here between the two videos and I'll play you a minute of this as well. Die Geschichte heißt, der Name der Geschichte ist Rotkäppchen. Es war einmal vor langer, langer Zeit, da lebte ein Mädchen. Das Mädchen lieb, lebte in einem kleinen Haus mit ihren, ihrer Mutter und sie hatte keinen Vater. Alle Menschen liebten das Mädchen. Und das Mädchens große Liebe war ihre Großmutter. Oma. Ihre Oma liebte das Mädchen so viel. Der Großmutter machte eine Kappe vor Rotkäppchen, vor das Mädchen. Da, äh, äh, das Mädchen warte das Kappe, in, äh, warte das Kappe jeder Tag. Eines Tages, das Mädchens Mutter sagte, Oh, dein Oma ist sehr krank. Sie liegt am Bett. Kannst du das? Äh, und äh, der Mutter gab, gab das Mädchen einen Korb, Korb. In der Korb war Wein und Kuchen. Der Mutter sagte, Oh, kannst du das Korb so Oma Okay, and here is where I'm going to stop. Um, so, it might be harder if you don't speak German, but if you do speak German, you definitely hear the change in accent um, between the first video and the second one. Um, and again, she has a really nice, like, just flow to her words, and she's, you can tell she's enjoying just telling the story. Um, and 
she, of course she has some moments where she thinks about, oh, wait, wait, well, how am I going to say that now? But it's very, still very fluent. Um, yep. And so here are some videos that she did. So there's two more that I included here um, that I also looked at, but really uh, the bold ones are the ones that you watched. So this one was after 83 stories, fifth in remote. Um, the words per minute are less now. So she says 81.2 words per minute, where it was 91.75. However, her tokens and type ratio got completely was very different here because she had 485 um, tokens in this video. So she said 485 words in six minutes. Um, but if you look at the uh, types, she really increased the variety of words that she used. So she has 128 types here where she had 47 before. So the token type ratio now is that she uses, before she used about uh, every type 7.81 times, and now it's just 3.79 times. Um, also, you can hear things that she switches from past to present tense and very like, um, does so really well within dialogue. She uses personal pronouns. So before she would always go back to the names and say, Atava this, Atava that. Now she uses uh, he and she. Um, also the possessive, possessive articles like ihre, her, and use of the reflexive. I don't think you saw that here, but she says, uh, says something later on where sie sich umdrehte. So that's a reflexive in German. Um, I just looked at these four videos to, because I was curious to see um, how many types she used in here. And whoops, and I wrote the wrong word. So disregard tokens right there, it should say types. So there were 273 types in those four stories. So the different 473 different words, it shouldn't be tokens, it should be types. So just have to note this here. So obviously this is not the output that every one of my students produces because that would be a dream, but that's not real. And um, that's not what we can expect. But um, through all this input, like there are things in there that she wouldn't have encountered in a normal by the textbook beginner class. So she couldn't have used it. Um, adjective endings that she got right that are just disregarded throughout the first year. Um, she wouldn't have learned the data um, different things that she has been using successfully in here. So that there's built-in differentiation with that. Also, um, the interest of her in the students, this created her, her agency. It created her agency for the student and independent learning because that's what she did. Independently, voluntarily, she went on to record these videos, write these stories um, because she was, she liked them so much. Um, and it was really about the stories. Uh, all students in my class began to speak and it varied very much and also by personality type because I have some very, very quiet students. They're quiet to begin with. Um, so why would I expect them to speak much in German? Um, and some of them actually asked me if they could try out the story listening in class. So do a story and we had enough time that I let them try it out because they asked uh, to do that. So um, even though it's an input only class, we do see that there's a lot of output that can be produced and that if, the, if you're making it a safe spot for them, they're willing to voluntarily produce, which is very nice. Okay, the last thing I wanna to talk to you and then I'm not taking up any more time, is um, a story listening uh, study that I did for a paper last year. So this is on adults, actually. It's an adult class that I taught. Um, and I'm not gonna say a lot about this. It's just something, this one is not published. Um, and you will hear later on from uh, Ken Smith. He will talk about the 
published studies. So in uh, my small little adult study in 2019, I had eight students. They varied from pre-A1 to B1. Um, and the length of re residency in Germany varied between one and a half to 16 years. So 16, you would expect maybe that's the B1, but no, that's actually uh, pre-A1. So another indication, it doesn't, it doesn't matter that they live in Germany. It's how much you, you integrate and how much input you actually get. Um, so I did a replication of the Mason and Crushen study from 2004. Um, and this was the study where, that looked at story listening and story listening plus. And I just did this one table for you to show I did it's the same exact setup and Ken will talk about it later more because it's also the same setup. Um, so I just want to show you um, that in the story only, so one class, they heard only a story. We did a pre and a post test and their gain was 6.1 um, points. It was 27 vocabulary items from the story. It took 45 minutes. And the efficiency for word per minute turned out to be 0.14 words per minute. Then I did a story plus study. So they did some activities afterwards. The gain was 11.6. They did two post tests. This was the second post test after the activities. Um, and this took 75 minutes. And when I did the delayed post test, um, it came out to be, the efficiency came out to be 0 0.15 words per minute. I do have to say that the story plus study um, group got, or not groups, the same students, but um, definitely got the advantage here because the story listening lab and, uh, lesson only happened two weeks before the post test and the story plus happened one week before the uh, post test. So there was a, an advantage given to the second one, but overall it fits in with um, the expectation of, or the findings, how many words um, the students are able to learn um, if you look at the results of the Mason and Crescent study. And that is all for me. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I will uh, give you back, lead you back to Ben. Thank you. Catherine, if you could stick around for two questions that came up, I was wondering if you might want to answer them. First, a lot of people are very interested in uh, your story listening recordings, which have been pretty phenomenal. I think you told me that you, you're up to about 86 stories that have been recorded um, this school year. So. I was hoping that we could post your YouTube channel um, to the video that will be put on our Stories First page so that people can go and watch, you know, like the story that you chose to use first compared to how you ended the first semester. Um, and so I wanted to ask um, two questions. So we had one question from um, Monica who asked um, if the, the student um, from India was German her third language possibly or a second language? Do, do you know? Um, Pooh, I would have to look it up. It's at least her third. At least her third. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think there's more. I think it's her third. So English is her second and this is her third. It's at least her third. Yeah. And the, um, the second question came from Sarah Nell who wanted to know if um, you had collected any uh, data on students speaking out of the context of retelling a story. So have you have you noticed any just like like normal like conversational German going on between the students or? Um, so I have the students um, who just come up to me and they engage me in conversation and so does she. So this is she doesn't just record the stories. She does say um, try to say as much as she can in German when she sees me. Um, and other students have been doing that as well. So if I see them around the school building, they will greet me in German. They would try to, you know, engage in a conversation. 
Um, and I've heard from the homeroom teachers that they've heard my students in the hallway try and speak German with each other. Mm. So it's obviously nothing that I can record. This kind of, uh, her videos are special in a way that I do have them. You know, it, because of these conversations, usually you don't record them. But this is something that she did voluntarily. And now it gives me all this material to look at and say like, oh, look, like these many words came up in, in what she did. Um, and so, yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. So next we're going to have um, Ken Smith who is going to talk about a replication study he did uh, in Indonesia this past summer with Dr. Mason and Dr. Krashen. So, um, Ken, whenever you're ready. Myself, right? This is me? Okay. Yep. Apologies okay. first. Okay. First, I want to apologize for, oh, there I am. Uh, apologize for my hair. Uh, recently, I've been, I don't know what's been happening to me, but my hair has been kind of falling out here. I don't think it has anything to do with the, the coronavirus or anything like that. I'm perfectly healthy. Uh, but I'm based in Taiwan, and I've been working in Taiwan for many years. Uh, and I work at a, a language university in southern Taiwan called Wenzhou Ursuline University of Languages. And at this, I work in the English department there. And uh, there's also Spanish, French, German, Japanese um, languages that are taught. Uh, there's, other, the, there's departments for those programs as well. I teach in the English department. And this study that I'm going to be talking about um, uh, was a, at a sister school uh, with my university in Taiwan, uh, in Indonesia. And so I'm going to uh, share, I hope I can do this correctly. I'm going to share this screen okay, with everyone. Okay, everyone see that? Yeah? Okay. And... I think I can even do it this way, okay? And so this, the name of this was Story Listening Indonesia Replication Study. And the study was recently published uh, this past year. Okay, what am I doing here? Okay, so everybody can see this, the abstract, okay. Um, this study reports on an attempted replication of four previous studies that were conducted. And these, this study in Indonesia was conducted with EFL students from five different Asian countries. Uh, and the findings confirm that subconscious vocabulary acquisition can not only occur from story listening using comprehension aiding supplementation, but also confirm that the gains were durable. Uh, so this means that there was a pre-test, a post-test, and a delayed post-test, and gains in vocabulary acquisition were, were shown on the delayed post-test. Okay. okay, so here are four uh, previous studies that were investigating vocabulary acquisition uh, through story listening. Um, Catherine had just mentioned the Mason and Krashen study from 2004. And this is just a, a chart table that, that shows a little bit more about uh, each of those four studies. So the Mason crash in 2004 was from Japan. There were 27 students. These were first year Japanese students um, at Dr. Mason's uh, university, I believe, uh, junior college students in Osaka, where there were two groups, a story listening only and a story listening plus group. And the 0.25 is referring to uh, words gained per minute. Um, I think that number is accurate, 0.25, although I think uh, Catherine might have, might have mentioned 0.15. Okay, so Mason, uh, there was another study, Mason, Bonata, Yander, Borsch, and Crashing in 2009. This was also in Japan, uh, seven students. 
Uh, but these students were actually students who were hearing a story in German. So they were Japanese students who were hearing a story in a language that they had, a second foreign language that they had, their, that they were beginners with. And there were three separate experiments done. And the, uh, the rate from story listening, vocabulary acquisition from story listening ranged from 0.10 to 0.23 words per minute. Uh, two years ago, Mason and Krashen uh, did a study with uh, high school students uh, in the US and in Colorado. And these students were learning Japanese as a foreign language. Uh, and they heard one Japanese folk tale um, and the vocabulary acquisition uh, from story listening was 0.17 words per minute. And I think it was last week or maybe two weeks ago, I think it was last week we heard from Stephen Clark, uh, who was also based in Japan. And he did a study in 2019 with, again, EFL students, English as a foreign language students uh, in Japan, junior college students uh, using story listening. And the gains were 0.19 words per minute. So we can see from these four studies, uh, the range is between about 0.10 to 0.25, all very close relatively close in terms of how much students gain from listening to stories. Okay. Each of these studies uh, had five common features. So they investigated uh, incidental vocabulary acquisition. Uh, they also applied CAS, comprehension aiding supplementation. Uh, they reported gains found from vocabulary development and listening to stories. The reported gains were durable, meaning that there was uh, gains present on delayed post-tests. And they also reported gains were greater and more lasting than a control group that had developed uh, from direct instruction. And Dr. Krashen, I believe we'll talk about, if he maybe talked about it last week or he's going to talk about it this week, about uh, direct instruction. So this, uh, study is only a partial replication of those four studies because uh, in, in this study that we did in Indonesia, uh, it did investigate vocabulary acquisition through uh, incidental vocabulary acquisition. Uh, it applied CAS, comprehension aiding supplementation, and it did report the gains were found in vocabulary development from listening to stories. And also the gains were durable, uh, meaning gains were uh, there on delayed post-tests. So it's important to know that this, there was no control group. There was just one single group that was uh, receiving story listening. Okay. So the research questions that we had when we were, uh, we didn't write this in the paper, but these are basically the three questions that we were interested in uh, learning about. So will vocabulary acquisition occur from hearing stories in this context? Uh, I'll tell you about the context shortly. Uh, uh, it was a short term program, but I'll explain about that in a minute. Uh, if vocabulary acquisition from story listening occurs, will it, will it be durable? The previous study showed that uh, after delayed post-tests, uh, the, the, the gains were still there. And will results replicate or refute uh, what previous in, uh, studies investigating vocabulary acquisition through story listening found. Okay, so the setting and the participants. Um, the setting was uh, at a university in Surabaya, Indonesia. Uh, so again, I think I mentioned that this was a sister university with the university that I, I work at in, in in Taiwan. And it was part of a three week program that ran from July 2nd to July 18th. And we were in class with students uh, from 930 in the morning till 12 o'clock uh, noon. So we saw them for uh, two and a half hours, 150 minutes Monday through Friday uh, during this during this program. And on Saturdays and Sundays, they had other kinds of activities that they were doing 
uh, excursions that they were going off to different places. And uh, Dr. Mason and I were, were allowed to propose a course that we wanted to introduce. And so we decided that the name of the course was going to be Story Listening and Guided Self-Selected Reading. Uh, so it was not just story, story listening in class. There was also a uh, guided self-selected reading component to it. There are 12 students, and they were all uh, university age students in universities in their own uh, countries. There were three from Malaysia, uh, three from Indonesia, four from South Korea, one from the Philippines, and one from Japan. So uh, this study is a little different in that um, the types of students that were involved, meaning that the previous studies were all students from one, one language background, so one L1, where these students are coming from different countries and also uh, speaking different L1s. Uh, measures and method. Uh, so this, we developed a 31 item translation test. And this was the only, te this was the only test that we used for this particular study. Uh, there's going to be uh, more studies that are another, at least another study um, based on this uh, experience in Indonesia. Uh, but there was a pre-test, a post-test, and a delayed post-test. Um, based on the, the Grimm's household tales, the juniper tree. Okay, and this, 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 the measures or the translation tests were the same, the same 31 items, they were just arranged in uh, different orders. Words were in different orders. And so students were just asked to translate uh, the vocabulary words that were given um, into their first language, their L1. A little bit about the method, what happened during the course. Um, I arrived, I arrived uh, the first, the day before the program was to start, but Dr. Mason arrived a few days later. And uh, we thought that it was important to also include a orientation program, an orientation before, I should say, the, the, the story listening actually occurred. And we did this because we knew that this would be something uh, students likely haven't experienced before. And so during the first two days of the program, um, Dr. Mason and I, she sent me uh, some, some PowerPoints and information to, to share uh, with the students on both what story listening was and uh, what guided self-selecting what guided self-selected reading was, and also some of the, the benefits that the students could expect from that. And as I mentioned, the, each class, each session that we had with these students was 150 minutes, Monday to Friday. So there were really 15 sessions that we had over this time period. And the pretest uh, was given the day before the students heard the story. Uh, this study was actually conducted not at the very beginning of this, this program. Uh, you'll see shortly the dates that I'll, that, that when they were given, when the pretests were given. Uh, but the, again, the words in the test that they were on all three tests were based on a story called the juniper tree. And these were words that both Dr. Mason and I suspected that students might not know. Uh, we were told that uh, these were going to be beginning level students. Uh, that's who we had hoped to work with, uh, but that wasn't actually really the case. I would, I would, just, I would say that there were, there were some students in the class that might have been a little less proficient in English than others, uh, but there were some, I would say, intermediate to even upper intermediate students in the class. Uh, the first author, Dr. Mason, told the juniper tree story during the study, and I checked the words that she had uh, used during the story. Okay. And the post-test was given immediately after the story was told, the same day, and the delayed post-test was given one week later. Okay. And in terms of, we asked students to 
which uh, is just a translation test. So we ask students to uh, translate the English words on the test into their first language. And so we found uh, native speakers of those languages uh, at the program as well. Not the students that we were teaching, but uh, students that were uh, at the other people that were at the at the program. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, so here are the 31 items in the vocabulary test. Uh, most of the words uh, we'll see are just single words, but there are there are other other words like to and fro. Uh, that's that's more than just a single word. Okay, and when we saw words like, for example, pious, uh, we accepted things, uh, translations that were related to that, uh, such as maybe religious or something like that. Okay. Okay, so here's the results. I'm going to just basically talk about the first table there here. Um, but the mean scores, this test was given on 710, but the program actually started on 72. So it was during the program. It wasn't at the very beginning. And so the mean or the average scores of all the students that took the test, the 12, was 9.25 words out of 31. So there was clearly a number of words on the test that uh, students didn't know. Uh, if they had known all the words on that test, maybe this would have been 30, close to 31, and there wouldn't have been possibility to show uh, gains through the, the treatment. And the post-test, uh, the day later, uh, they gained about seven and a half words uh, from just listening to this story, okay? And that was given, that's the post-test, 9.25 to 16.92. And then we see that there's, there's a very small drop-off. So on the delayed post-test, uh, it goes from 16.92 to 16.33. And so this is quite uh, encouraging, I think, because this shows that the treatment that was um, done was helpful for these students. They gained about seven, a little more than seven words from hearing this, this one story. Okay. okay, so here it is. Here's the gain stores. This, this table is not in the, in the, in the published paper, um, but the gain scores we see, this is again, pre-test to delayed post-test. And we see gain scores of 7.08. And so how do we get that uh, rate or words gained from story listening per minute? It's a lot of the, all these studies are looking at gains in terms of vocabulary gain from words per minute, okay? So when we calculate this, uh, we calculate how long the story took to tell. Uh, that story took 30 minutes and they gained 7.08 uh, words over, from listening to this story. So we can calculate the rate by saying words per minute equals the gain scores over the time for the story. So this is 0.24 was the calculation, the, the, the rate that we came up with. Uh, gain scores 7.08 over um, 30 minutes. That's what gave us the 0.24. Okay. Everybody understand that? If you don't understand that, it's okay. Uh, I, I understand some, some people, some teachers get a little nervous or about uh, statistics and calculations and things like that. I try to keep these calculations as simple as possible. Okay, here's another um, statistical uh, important thing I think for for research studies that look at um, uh, gains or effects that some sort of treatment has on an outcome and so effect size is a term that's used quantitative measure of impact a treatment has on an outcome so in our case we're looking at uh, what effect does story listening have on vocabulary acquisition, okay? And so Cohen, there's a, there's a Cohen's D. Uh, this is just referring to effect size. And um, it's measured in terms of small, meaning 
0.2 effect size, medium effect size is 0.5, the large effect size is 0.8. And it, I think it's interesting to point out that the average in educational research, the average effect size uh, is 0.4. So it's somewhere between small and medium effect size. When we calculated the effect size based on the pretest and delayed post test, um, the effect size we found for our study was 1.29. So we can see that this had a very large um, effect. The story list had a very large effect. Okay, so discussion and conclusion. Um, I want to restate that this is only a partial replication because in this study, uh, there was no control group. I mentioned that at the beginning, there was just one group of 12 students. There was not a control group doing something else. However, it did confirm that vocabulary does indeed occur from listening to stories and that the effects were durable, meaning that the gains were showed on, or appeared on the delayed post-test. Um, had, had it just returned back to the scores 9.25 or somewhere in that neighborhood, um, we wouldn't have been so optimistic or pos uh, positive about the results, but it didn't. It said they gained 7.08. And so the rate of acquisition was substantial. And it was also similar to the previous studies that looked at vocabulary acquisition through story listening. Uh, there's a note, there's a number of, a few notes in the paper, uh, but this, this is one that I want to mention as well, just today, tonight, or today, wherever you are. Concerning the delayed post-test gain scores, it's possible that reading contributed to these positive results. Uh, the course that we were teaching uh, was not just story listening or story listening plus guided self-selected reading. Uh, both Dr. Mason and I had brought a, a number of graded readers, books that are written for uh, second language learners uh, in with us to Indonesia. I think there was probably, we both brought suitcases full of, of books to share with these students. And I think we had about 150 or 200 uh, graded readers that we had brought from our universities. And so these, we also kept reading journals. These reading journals was just a, it's just a form that we both have developed slightly different, but really the same information that we're both looking for. She, Dr. Mason used with her students in Japan, and I used with my students in Taiwan. And so we gave them this form, and just a single page that says, that asks for things like uh, the, the name of the book, the author, uh, the series, where it comes from, was it Oxford Bookworms, was it uh, Penguin Readers, was it Macmillan uh, Guided Readers, uh, a number of different series that we had brought. And so the students, we looked at how much the students had read over this three week program. And it ranged from 240 to 1500 uh, pages uh, uh, during the course. And the, the mean scores, the average scores were 614 pages for these 12 students. So it's possible um, that some of the words that they had met uh, on the test, they, they could have met during this, this reading period as well. Some references, and these are some of the references to, to Stephen Clark's paper. You can find the links here. This is the Comprehensionating Supplementation uh, paper. Uh, you can find the links here. Uh, we like to provide these on our own websites, the publications, and you can find on Dr. Krashen's and Dr. Mason's uh, website and some others. And I'm, gonna, I'm a little bit hesitant to do this, uh, but I'm actually in the beginning stages of creating my own website. Um, and that, that is up. I don't think anybody actually knows that. Even Dr. Mason and Dr. Krashen don't know this yet as well. They've encouraged me to do this 
uh, but I, it was, it was up for a while and it came down. Uh, but, oh, oh, before I get to that, sorry about that. There, there, I want to state where we actually are now. And, oh, this is wrong. This should be point, yeah, point two four. Okay. This is a little, something's a little funny here. Okay. So, um, this is kind of a summary of the five studies now that are dealing with vocabulary acquisition rates from story listening. Uh, I mentioned earlier in the, in the introduction, uh, Mason crash in 2004 in Japan, uh, the first year Japanese students, uh, the, the, the rate from story listening was 0.25 words per minute. Uh, the, the study, Mason, Renata, Meander, Borsch, and Crash, and the German students in Japan, uh, three different experiments, 0.1, zero to 0.23 and Mason crash in with the Colorado students, uh, Colorado in Colorado with the Japanese uh, students in a foreign language who just listened to one story, 0.17. Uh, Clark study with EFL students in Japan, 0.19. Uh, this shouldn't be here, that's 0.19 is, is not right. But the, our study that, we, that was just published uh, this past year, uh, Mason, Smith and crash in, uh, EFL students in, in, in Asia, uh, five different countries, uh, had gains of 0.24. So we can see that all of these results are really very quite similar, okay? And there's another formula that I want to uh, put out there for, for people who are interested in story listening and vocabulary acquisition. Uh, if we were allowed to give, Catherine talked about uh, telling 86 stories to her, her German students. Um, if we were allowed to, to give 100 stories uh, to our students, and each of those stories were about 30 minutes long, uh, this may be different based on if it's in, in class or if it's uh, over the internet. And if we had an, a, a gain that we found from our, this most recent study, of 0.24 words per minute. From listening to 100 stories, uh, 30 minutes in class, uh, students could gain 720 words. 100 stories times 300, uh, three, 30 stories times 0.24 uh, would give us 720 words gained from story listening. Okay. And I will end. This is this is a work in progress, and it's it's there's a lot of things that are not yet up there, and it will be improved on as I as we go along. But it will have publications that will be uh, available for anyone to open and download and and read, and it will also have um, things about. Uh, uh, student written books that I have my students write for story for reading classes. They're advanced students that are that write books for less proficient students in English. And I think there's about maybe 120 uh, books that have been written by by students there. And there's also a, a little bit about a, a, a reading group in the library at my university. Uh, I run a reading program that meets Tuesday nights uh, called Book Travelers. And these are just uh, students that are interested in reading and it's a, it's a reading discussion group. So we all read the same book and we discuss the book together. Uh, students get to choose the book and the university provides the books for them. Okay, so I'll end there. Again, I wanna repeat that this is a work in progress. There's a lot that still needs to be worked on. Uh, my university semester just ended today, today. and so uh, this will be updated uh, over the summer. Thank you very much, and I will end there. Thank you, Ken. I was hoping um, you might be able to um, answer one question that came up, and also if, if Dr. Mason, if you wanted to to add in on this as well, it could be helpful. 
the question was regarding um, the delayed post test. Are they mm -hmm. typically given, you know, one week following this story? And do we have much data currently on post tests that are given, you know, three weeks later or, you know, many months later? Are we finding that retention rates still outperform, you know, like stories plus or direct teaching? Um, and, and so I, I, I just wanted to ask if, if, if there's many studies that people can read yeah, yeah, on their yeah. own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay I'm on. so glad. I'm so glad that somebody asked that question. The delayed post test is not always just one week later. Sometimes right. it's like five weeks to seven weeks later. So it's not only just one week later. That's what I wanted to say. Ken? Yeah, I, I agree. There's, there's studies that are, that are not just one week later. I think for our study, it was, that was just what was possible. Uh, it was, in a, it was a part of a program that lasted for three weeks, and the delayed post-test, I think, was, was given on the very last day of that program. Um, so we didn't really have the opportunity to, to give a delayed post-test two weeks or three weeks or five weeks later. Know that um, okay. Stephen Clark brought this up because he has a a study that, that he performed that has not yet been published, where he is encouraging us that are involved in story listening to continue to provide more case studies on you know delayed post tests that come six months later and see our, our retention rates still outperforming any other teaching practices. So like to, for everyone, for all of us involved, we know it's a, it's a work in progress and, but everything, everything is pointing in the right direction that, that story listening is the best or most efficient and effective practice so far for acquisition. Yes, of, of but, you can't, but you cannot, <laughs> uh, you can't give a, a delayed post six months later because during that time, students learned so much in a program like this it will not be the effect of the story listening, that story alone, when they, you give a test like six weeks, I mean, six months later. Six weeks is really, is, is a lot, uh, because during that six weeks, if the students are reading lots of books, it could be the, uh, the, the, the result of the uh, delayed post could be the result of reading books too, reading, right. and other, other stories. It'd be very yeah. hard to isolate that language specifically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shall we go to the Dr. question? Sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So uh, our, our final speaker of the night is Dr. Stephen Krashen, and he is going to discuss uh, an article that he wrote about the direct teaching of vocabulary, question mark. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, nice to see you all again, although I can't see you. I want to announce that I have just been to Ken Smith's website, and it is up and running. Take a look. Ken Smith, bravesites.com, and it looks really good. So happy you're doing this, Ken. Great. Get it out there. We can share. And Ken talked about how this is a work in progress. Hey, it's always a work in progress. This is the way it is. These things are changing all the time. Uh, people complain about that. I had this friend who, whenever he sent a new paper out to, for, to colleagues, he had a little stamp that he put on it. And it said, this does not represent my current position because things are always changing. Fine. This means we're making progress all the time and you can expect more to come. This one line of research on story listening has been extremely productive and I will talk a little bit about it. Okay, direct teaching um, of vocabulary. <clears throat> I had my wake up call a number of years ago when like most people, my most elderly people like me, um, gosh, I'm older now than I've ever been. This is most, most alarming. Anyway, I was trying to clean up and I came across my high school French books. Uh, and my college, I took one course in French lit in college and uh, it had a reader. And in the back, in all these cases, I had a list of vocabulary that I had looked up made a list of the words I didn't know with the definitions, with the firm intention of going over the list again and studying them, uh, my French has gotten a lot better. 
since I took these classes. In fact, it's, it's pretty good. I, I like to speak languages whenever I can because I like to dispel the rumor that I'm monolingual, which went around for quite a while. And I like to encourage other people to do it too, whenever it's appropriate. So my French has gotten a lot better through massive amounts of reading. My vocabulary is much larger than it was when I took these classes. I still didn't recognize the meanings of a lot of those words. I still haven't acquired them. Writing it down, intending to study it later, and even if you do, is not very effective. In the meantime, I've acquired lots of other words. The same thing, I did the same thing when I was a music student in the early 60s in Vienna. I did really well with German, not, not so well with piano, that's another story. Uh, and what I would keep with me, which some of you do, is a notebook that I put in my pocket. And whenever I saw a new word on a sign, when I went for a walk, someone used a word, I would jot it down with the firm intention of reviewing it. And oftentimes I did. I had the words, the flip side, the flashcards, reviewing just as you've done. And I really did it thoroughly and carefully. I found my pile of flashcards. I don't know half of those words. In the meantime, my German vocabulary has expanded dramatically. And it gave me the idea that maybe this wasn't the best way to do it, the conscious study. The assumption is still that this is the way we acquire vocabulary. And the assumption is that this study is the only way we do it. I have a number of storybooks here in various languages. I have storybooks in Spanish, French, et cetera. Uh, people have sent them to me, occasionally I buy them. And they always have stories, some of which are quite compelling. And in the end of the story is a vocabulary list and vocabulary exercises. This is a statement by professionals that reading is not sufficient, and it's also a statement that it's not the way we get vocabulary. But there's no other way through reading. This is what we found again and again. Let me give you some basic arguments against direct teaching. And the handout I've used for this is not a new one, which means there are updates all the time, just as Ken said, we're constantly coming up with new things. A basic argument, which I think is absolutely right, <clears throat> you can't do vocabulary one word at a time. There are too many words. The native speakers know, native speakers know, the, these are estimates, between 50,000 and 150,000 words in their own language. As Frank Smith has pointed out, that's not 50,000 trips to the dictionary. That's not 50,000 times when someone has explained the meaning of a word. The only way this could happen is we absorb it, as we'll see, through context. Uh, a study was done by Kim Aller, uh, John Aller's brother, really interesting study, a vocabulary size of multilinguals, bilinguals, trilinguals, you can imagine. It's not 50,000, 150,000 words. It's 250,000, it's 350,000. Every one of the people listening to this talk has a huge vocabulary, especially if you combine all the languages they know. Well, what are the arguments against teaching? The quantity, yes, and the subtlety of vocabulary. The fact that a simple definition won't do it. Uh, the di uh, obvious definitions we take for granted, uh, the connotations of words, uh, the difference between house and home. Uh, this, is, this means that a simple definition is no longer sufficient and people acquire these things without skill building. My favorite study showing this, second cat category, you can acquire vocabulary without instruction. So, uh, study came out 1984. Um, they interviewed company presidents, successful and I hope ethical capitalists. They first of all gave them a vocabulary test. They had a lot of people in the sample too, about 50 of them. And they found that company presidents on the average had pretty good vocabulary. They scored very well in these tests. They then asked them how, how they asked them if they had consciously tried to increase their vocabulary over time. Half of them said yes. They all thought vocabulary was important. What percentage used vocabulary books that help you build a larger vocabulary? Of those 
increase their vocabulary, only 14% went to vocabulary books. It's actually 3% of their total sample. So people who are successful with this haven't done this through direct study. I remember when I was in high school back in 1906, a book came out called 30 Days to a More Powerful Vocabulary. And my friends and I, because we were very eager students, uh, we got the book and we studied it. And it was exercises to draw a line from the word to the def definition, uh, all this stuff. We thought this was the way. What the company president studies tells us, people who build their vocabularies don't use these books. You have this feeling you're growing in vocabulary in the books. The book was a bestseller, 30 days. But you're much better off reading, reading, listening, etc. Next category, the studies that um, Ken Smith has just uh, worked through. Uh, the most negative study I know of this, it was uh, a study in progress, Catherine Checkman, who talked about it a little in her talk. And in this one, uh, it came out pretty good. <laughs> the most negative study still shows that this, this instruction is not the way to work, not the way to do it. Let me give you my brief uh, description of these studies. As you know, uh, let's say one group, or one condition, they do story listening as described by and uh, developed by Benico Mason. The teacher tells a story that, in her words, have st has stood the test of time. In her case, Grimm's fairy tales, uh, all kinds of other stories like this that we know are good stories, excellent stories. Uh, the story listening person makes a list of words before going in that uh, she thinks the students may have trouble with and prepares various ways of assisting uh, to help make the words comprehensible. Uh, this could be uh, uh, writing, uh, I'm sorry, this could be drawing pictures, it could be giving a brief definition, uh, the use of context, background knowledge, etc. all these things. Well, the goal, this is the important point for me, the goal, and the students understand this, is not to master those words. It's not like the activities that come after the readers. It's to make the story more comprehensible and very often to enrich the story, to make the story more interesting. Nevertheless, on, as you heard before, on delayed tests, reasonable delays, the students retain a pretty good percentage of the words. If you add to this another condition of doing vocabulary exercises, students can do better. They do better in most of the studies, but it's not efficient because it takes so much more time. So in terms of words acquired per minute, you're much better off telling another story. Again, in the most negative study, Catherine Sechman's study, adding the vocabulary building exercises didn't help. It didn't increase the efficiency. And as Catherine uh, points out, the time delay was uh, longer for these people. So even the most negative study we have, I think, is quite, quite positive. Important point against direct teaching. Acquisition doesn't happen at once. It's gradual. Big point. The person who first introduced this, a guy named Twadell, T-W-A-D-E-L-L, -L, said this in 1973, before your mother was born. He says, we may know a very large number of words with various degrees of vagueness in a twilight zone between the darkness of unfamiliarity and the brightness of complete familiarity. This is powerful. This was confirmed by researchers at the University of Illinois in first language, and we have replicated it in second language. What do you do? You have people read something, a passage, and you give them a test on words that were unfamiliar to them, or thought were unfamiliar to them. Some of the <clears throat> distractors <clears throat> have nothing to do with the meaning of the word. Some of the distractors have a clue as to the meaning, a partial amount of the meaning. When you do an analysis of the distractors that don't help, you get one number. When you do an analysis of the distractors that have a little clue to the meaning or part of it, people do better. They don't know more words. They don't do bigger on the whole test. But this shows they've acquired a little bit of the meaning from even one exposure to the word. This is really, really important. The Illinois team has concluded 
And each time you see a word in print, you get a little piece of it. Their estimate, you get between five and 10% of the meaning of the word, even if you're not consciously aware of it. Extrapolate this. If this is constant, or each time you see it, you get this little bit, it's going to take 10, 20 times to get the full meaning of the word. Each time, you're going to get a little more, a little more. Uh, we have replicated this, uh, and uh, other people have replicated this. It's been replicated with different languages, in fact. So quick, rapid learning all at once doesn't count. A good example of this, <clears throat> I heard a talk by Steve Kaufman, who I regard as my language therapist, uh, a, a very a competent polyglot. He talks about what has happened to him in languages, and this one really helped. He says, when he's reading along and he comes to a word that he doesn't know, and he really is curious, and he looks it up, very often, by the time he goes back to the text, he has forgotten what the word was that he looked up. It's not just one time, folks. Again, again, and again, seeing it in different contexts, etc. cetera. Uh, and you don't have to, you know, make sure you see it again and read the same story again or so. It's going to happen again. If you get comprehensible input, what we call your I plus one, you get enough of it, is always going to be there. It will happen. And if it doesn't come back, you didn't need it in the first place. So don't expect rapid learning. It's a little at a time. Uh, all of this boils down really to using context to make input more comprehensible, the most frequent way of doing this. The, there have been arguments against context. Don't depend on context. Context is not reliable. Context can fool you because it's not always correct. It can lead you off into the wrong areas. Well, a study was done in 1993. A researcher named Perry, this is one of several studies. She looked at what she called an advanced acquirer of English as a second language at a university who was trying to improve an academic English technical vocabulary. They asked this language acquirer to read a fairly demanding text in an anthropology textbook, indicate the words she didn't know, and then look at the list again and guess of the meaning of those words. Good test of whether context helps. 37% of the words she guessed correctly. 40% she got partially right. Total those together. 77% of the time, context was helpful. Context didn't help at all or was dead wrong, left her in the wrong directions, 22% of the time. So we're getting 75% of the time about context is helpful. And the times when it puts you off in the wrong direction, don't worry, you're gonna see it again and again in helpful context. It has to be context. Otherwise, people would never develop these huge vocabularies. Uh, even if uh, the instruction worked, you don't get that much instruction. You don't get it on all the 100,000 words you know, um, et cetera. Well, what are the problems here? And here's where I engage in true uh, confessions. It's important we tell people what we have done wrong and what our problems are. The word I use here is undertow. I got this word from Alfie Cohn, brilliant student of education, writes wonderful books. He gave a talk actually in my hometown and he talked about the enemy of doing things right. There's a powerful undertow toward traditional instruction. You know the term undertow from swimming. They always tell you beware the undertow. You go into an area of water and in, in the natural uh, water body, and there's sometimes a, a, a tendency for the water to pull you in the wrong direction, a toe, an unusually be, you know, below the surface of the water, and can get you into danger if you're not careful. There is an undertow here, and we feel the undertow of traditional instruction. Even I do. And I will say that I have been one of the champions of going away from traditional instruction, I've devoted most of my waking hours in the last 45 years saying that traditional instruction is gonna pull you in the wrong direction. It's a dangerous undertow. And we have to be very careful with it. 
I sometimes give in. I'll give you my latest experience. I read a lot of graded readers. I'm experimenting with myself in Spanish. Uh, I like Benico's suggestion that you need, uh, Dr. Mason's suggestion, you need 100, 200, 300 graded readers. It's, and I have a collection. I'm nearly done reading them. I got to find some more. Problem is they're expensive, but we're finding, producing more of them, they're going to be free. And I've been reading graded readers every day, and I've got some good ones. And I understand them pretty well. After each, and I'm getting better too, I can give you the reasons why I think so. Um, after each chapter, sometimes at the end, is a glossary. Even though I understand the words, rarely am I completely confused about the meanings. Rarely do I need to consult the glossary. I have this overwhelming pull that I've got to check it out anyway, just to make sure I get it right. I have a hard time resisting the temptation. I've read uh, several graded readers that don't have the vocabulary in the back. Uh, written by Bill Van Patten, who's doing some really interesting stories in Spanish and from his own background, personal experiences, and they're really quite, quite compelling. Uh, relationships and family, brother, sister, all this stuff, very, very good. No glossary, I have no trouble understanding them, even though they're a lot Bill's, Bill uh, Van Patten's things are a lot harder than the ones that have the vocabulary. Even very simple ones, I feel this temptation all the time to look in the back. About a year and a half ago, I read my first novel in Spanish, Isabella Allende Zorro. Oh gosh, was it good. Every single paragraph, every sentence pushed you on. You wanted to read more. I didn't have a glossary. I didn't even think about it because the book was so compelling. The cure to resisting the undertow is what we call optimal input. And the main feature of that is compelling input. Let me give you one more <clears throat> piece of evidence. I can tell you a little bit more about one of our favorite researchers, Jeff McQuillan. Uh, people are very concerned about academic vocabulary, academic language. We have found in, in the analysis we've done that uh, uh, Claire Walters found this as well, that uh, so-called stories do have a fair amount of pretty demanding vocabulary in them. So you do pick this up. This was confirmed by Jeff McQuillan in an article that appeared in Reading Matrix quite uh, recently called, Where Do We Get Our Academic Vocabulary? You can get a free copy. <clears throat> Go to a wonderful website called ResearchGate, and his article is there. And I've begun to put a lot of my articles there. <clears throat> Someone's going to shut them down one of these days because they're probably, you know, losing circulation of their journals. The journals are too expensive. We really have no choice. I think it's a good deed. We call this a mitzvah in Yiddish to actually use this to push the uh, profession in this direction. Uh, Jeff's article there is a survey <clears throat> of uh, readers of stories, uh, basically for young adults. Uh, authentic reading <clears throat> that has a huge amount of, uh, amount of, of uh, academic vocabulary, uh, so, uh, so-called rare words, etc. So we can get a lot of this from the reading we're doing. We don't need the direct instruction. Uh, Jeff McQuillan has made another contribution that I want to tell you about. Jeff McQuillan is saving the world, let me tell you, uh, is helping people stay away from the coronavirus. It is well known in the bodybuilding world that the center of bodybuilding is Gold's Gym in Venice. And of course, it's, uh, we have, Jeff and I have increased the value and the reputation by working out there ourselves. I mean, if these two famous researchers in language studies work out there, other people will certainly start coming. Uh, uh, anyway, we've been training there. And Jeff was very excited, and so was I, when Gold's opened up again. It opened up yesterday morning at 4 a.m. And uh, Arnold works out there. You know, remember him, Arnold Schwarzenegger? And he works out very early in the morning, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock. And he showed up, and he discovered that Gold's allows you to train without a mask, which I think is really wrong. Arnold decided not to come. And this was in all the newspapers. Even bigger, 
Jeff McQuillan wrote to Gold's Gym and said, I support Arnold. I follow Jeff's lead and I wrote there and now we have won. I'm sure it was me and Jeff that did it. Arnold helped a lot, but Jeff has saved lives. Not only has he opened up the world uh, to the real way to vocabulary acquisition, but he has prevented the spread and has made uh, Gold's Gym a wonderful place again. Okay, you may find the uh, paper, the paper I wrote on this uh, back in uh, 2019 with Monico Mason, it's there. But again, I'm gonna repeat what Ken said. This is a work in progress. And since I wrote that paper, other things have come out, including Jeff's paper, including the exciting ongoing research on the impact of story listing on vocabulary acquisition. Thank you very much. J'ai fini, did you something? Dr. Krashen, are you finished? Yes, I have finished. I had um, a, a question for you that was uh, brought up by somebody that said, well, maybe I'm just not really into stories, but I like podcasts. So I did name drop <laughs> Jeff McQuillan and ESL Pod. Do you mm -hmm. recommend any other, do you, do you find any other like compelling podcasts that for language learning? I am sure they're out there. All I will do is repeat the uh, requirements. We want it to be interesting, very interesting, compelling. We want it to be comprehensible. We want the new vocabulary to be well supported by, by it coming back many times in what Benico has called rich environments, which means it gives you some idea of what the meanings are and adds to the value. And if you are excited about it, then it's right for you. I have mm -hmm. nothing against podcasts, et cetera. Uh, so any way you can get the comprehension, I found that reading is by far the most reliable. You're gonna get a lot of stuff in reading, but if you wanna add podcasts to your repertoire, fine, go ahead. I can't tell you which ones, it's gonna be different for everybody. It's of like self-selected reading, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. There, there were no questions. I think people just sat back and enjoyed your talk. No questions, Your Honor. Good. <laughs> so uh, thank you for, for um, Catherine and Ken and Dr. Krashen for presenting tonight. Um, next week, we will be joined by Dr. Mason, as well as Ignacio Amandos, who will be providing us with a story listening demonstration for a more um, advanced setting. I think he does uh, private tutoring um, with adults or higher, higher level learners. So in this case, we'll, from, our, from our three sessions, we'll have had an intermediate story listening demonstration, a beginner level, and then an advanced level. So I hope everyone can tune in. And I'm going to end today by sharing my screen with a picture of everyone's website. I did also just check out Ken Smith's website as well. So I'm really happy that that's up, up, and, up and running as well. So I'll, I'll put up, um, this will be part of the recording so you guys can screenshot it or um, just pause the video and, and, and write down the names of these websites. And we'll try to include many of the case studies um, that have been um, included in tonight's presentations. And thank you so much for participating in tonight's talk. Um, we'll see you next week. And, um, and here's, you, here's, here's, here's the screen. So our presenters tonight. We have um, Dr. Krashen's website, Benico Mason's website, uh, Katrin's website, uh, her YouTube channel, and her um, website as well, Ken Smith's new website, and as well as the Stories First Foundation. Be sure to please register on our YouTube page and maybe sign up for our Facebook page as well for upcoming seminars. Thank you so much for joining in. Feel free to comment below if any of your questions weren't answered tonight.